Okay, everybody. Um, this next talk will be uh, by Helmut Krone about how to actually create a new Debian architecture bootstrapping thing without uh, hiring uh, those two up front to spend a couple of weeks on doing it. So, Helmut. Thank you very much. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is my very first DevCon talk. I hope I'm doing it well. Uh, there are very many people who have contributed to this topic. So I tried to put them into the footnotes instead of pronouncing uh, them and uh, making a fool of myself. Um, the talk will contain quite a bit of detail, which I hope is useful to some of you. So uh, don't get scared by that detail in some question uh, situations. Still, if you have qu uh, questions for understanding particular things where I'm too fast, uh, try to interrupt and ask. Uh, for discussions, please refer to the end or to the uh, BOF tomorrow. So uh, the first question we should answer over here is what is an architecture bootstrap? So what it means is if we have a new Debian architecture and we want to have the initial population of the Debian archive for that architecture, then we refer to that as a bootstrap. It's a means to obtain the initial set of packages. And in this talk, we are not looking at the native phase. We are only looking at the part which finishes when we have the built essential base system. Oh, it's gone offline. That was too long. Ah, great. So uh, once we have uh, built essential packages, then we are done for this particular talk. Uh, the first question uh, when thinking about bootstrap that may come to your mind is, why should we care about it? Why is it important to work on that? particular thing. So a good, good reason to do that is uh, looking how often we do it, and it's about every year for the past 20 years. So it's quite a bit common. Uh, the most recent bootstraps have been ARM64 and PPC 64 el and there has been an out-of-archive uh, bootstrap of open risk. And we're going to see MIPS 64 el being added to the archive, maybe. And there also uh, are ideas to do a risk v bootstrap, and uh, then there also is the Moodle, Moodle C library, which may turn up as architectures. So it's actually quite common to uh, bootstrap things, and we should maybe automate that. Uh, another good reason to do bootstraps is that it actually gives a bit of freedom, being able to build the base system from source again. Uh, in contrast to relying to the build essential system for every architecture built once and only being able to go from there. So it, it means that we have, if we have the build essential packages for one architecture, then we can somehow obtain with a bootstrap method the build essential packages for another architecture, which currently is rather difficult. Um, then if, if bootstrap was more automated, then we could even have more architectures for like optimized builds, and uh, maybe X32 comes to your mind, which is the optimized architecture for MD64 with 32 bits, and other architectures, and this may become more feasible to do. And also, I if Debian is bootstrappable all the time, uh, then uh, it may be become more attractive as an embedded distribution, which tries to tailor uh, it's a package set to a particular application, which MDebian has been doing, and it's maybe now getting better with a more integrated bootstrap experience. So when I got interested in this topic about two years ago, I started looking into a sub-architecture bootstrap and figured that I'd write down what I uh, experience, and then I figured I could do this in a machine-readable way, and then there was a little script uh, which is now called Rebootstrap, and uh, it developed into a QA tool which just tries to bootstrap an architecture from nothing but uh, binaries from a built architecture. Um, it's currently running on Jenkins.debian.net, uh, occupying some cores over there. Uh, it's running for 20 architectures, and we do that every day. I think 
Each architecture is tried about once a week or like that. Um, uh, it currently cross-builds about 100 packages. This is not the build essential base system. It's some part of it, it's initial, an initial set, and uh, it needs to get more packages built. So it can currently cannot be used to obtain the base system, but it gets a bit into that direction. In the process of developing this thing, uh, 190 bugs were filed, and thanks to lots of maintainers uh, applying these patches, 120 are already fixed. So it's not so much about having a tool that does this bootstrap, but integrating all the fixes that arise from that into the archives, into the packages that are being built. And it's very great to see the support and various maintainers, in particular the GCC maintainer and many others. So thank you very much over there. So this shall conclude the introduction, and the remainder of the talk will be structured uh, that will briefly talk about cross-tool chains, um, then about actual cross-building, uh, because it's a prerequisite of uh, bootstrapping, and then about the actual architecture bootstrap phase. Okay, so uh, when we talk about cross-tool chains, uh, I'd like to give a little reminder or new about uh, the terminology used over here. We're using the GNU terminology to refer to architecture names. So when I say build architecture, what I do mean is the machine I am building on. When I say host architecture, what I mean is what uh, I want to run the build package on. And target is only applicable to compilers. It says um, what the compiler is supposed to produce. And whenever these three architecture values differ in some way, we are saying it is some kind of cross-build. And if you take nothing from this talk but this slide, then you should remember that whenever you are unsure about which of these to use in a package, then host is most often right, with some exceptions. Um, okay, so cross-tool chains. Uh, the good news is that this is mostly a solved problem. Uh, we have cross-tool chains in the archive in Unstable right now, and they can be installed, they work. Uh, that's great. This wasn't the case like two years ago. Uh, good. Uh, if uh, this is done in a bootstrap setting, uh, there is a little dance involved, which means that first a little bit of GCC has to be built, then the glibc headers, and then a little bit more of GCC, and then a library package for of glibc, and then more of GCC. And once this bootstrap is done, then we have, well, a cross compiler and the libc integrated into that. Um, Currently, there are two approaches to producing cross compilers. They differ in whether to use cross architecture dependencies, which are not really supported by the archive currently. Um, but from my perspective, both approaches work, and that's good. Uh, a few glibc patches need upstreaming. Uh, there's still work in progress uh, on that. So if you try to do this at home, uh, you need to obtain um, patches either out of cross tool chain base or out of uh, the bug tracking system where they are filed. So for most architectures in this work, there are some architectures for this uh, for which this doesn't work as well. So if you see your pet architecture on this slide over there, uh, then you should get in contact with me uh, to maybe fix that. Okay, so from my perspective, cross tool chains are mostly a thing that works and which I use. Uh, let's get into cross-building. Cross-building also works in principle for years. Uh, some packages have cross-build support which is as old as 10 years. And Debian has been doing lots of work over here. Um, at this point in time, you can mostly just do cross-builds with the, the S-build version in Unstable, although it gets better if you use the experimental version. Uh, you still need to pass lots of different flags to make it actually work, but I think that's going to be fixed. Uh, if uh, you just build with the package, build package, then it's just a matter of adding an architecture flag and then you're doing a cross build. So that's great. Uh, but before we can look into actual cross building, uh, we need to look into satisfiability of build depends. So it is a thing that we take for granted in the native case is that we can install build depends. This is not so easily done in the cross case when we're using the multi-arch. 
uh, facilities because, uh, well, when satisfying two architectures, many packages have not satisfiable build depends. And it turns out out of 20,000 source, source packages, only 3,000 can be, uh, the, the build depends can be installed. Uh, there is this uh, nice page generated by the botch tour of Johannes Schauer, uh, which displays problems about uh, packages. Uh, and if we try to get a big picture of what the current problems are, then there are basically two things. It's uh, cross-tool chain dependency translations, uh, which I come to in a minute, and the other is a, a general multi archify more things. Uh, so let's look into tool chain dependency translation. So we have this libstdc++6 transition going on at, at the moment. And in order to make packages work, we often add like build depends G++ with version right now. So when a cross build sees this dependency, uh, then this dependency is resolved for the host architecture. Um, that means what we actually get, get here for a cross build is it would install the native compiler for the host architecture, but we cannot execute it for the host architecture if it would work at all. So this is not what we want for a cross build. For a cross build, what we actually want is a, a compiler that produces things for the host architecture, but runs on the build architecture. In other words, a cross compiler. So we need to somehow translate these dependencies. Uh, an idea that has come up uh, a year ago is to have a special package called G++ for host, um, which you can put into uh, your build depends, and which is supposed to ensure that the compiler for the architecture you are building for is available on the system. Uh, this solution has a proof of concept uh, in experimental. It's in the GCC cross support package. And uh, your review is welcome as to make that solution work. But please don't upload packages to unstable with, um, with such a dependency, yet uh, it's not finalized. OK, so uh, now we look into the multi-arch part. So um, well, we have been doing multi-arch for like Wizzy and Jesse, and it just goes on over here. There are still packages which are required for bootstrapping, which do not have proper multi-arch support, but which need to have. And this is just doing that. Uh, but there also is uh, this uh, funky multi-arch interpreter problem, uh, which is, uh, needs a bit more e explanation. So the common situation where it occurs is when we have a dependency chain from an application package through like a Perl module, which is just con consisting of scripts, uh, which in turn depends on a Perl extension, which is loaded into the interpre interpreter. Now, in order for this to work, the application and the extension need to have the same architecture. Otherwise, they can't coexist in the same Perl interpreter. Now let's assume that the Perl extension is already properly multi-archified and is uh, multi-arch same. So in principle, we could be installing the application for foreign architecture. But then we notice that architecture all has a special meaning, which means, well, it is considered installed for the native architecture, with a, which is the architecture of the package. And that means that if we try to install the application uh, for foreign architecture, the upper dependency cannot be satisfied. OK? So we could think over here that we should be mocking this Perl module with a foreign tag, but that would be wrong. It isn't foreign. Uh, we've been looking at solutions for this and not coming up with anything convincing yet. But there is a workaround we might apply, which is turning the package into architecture any multi-arch same, even though it is truly architecture independent. At that point, you may have to install it multiple times for multiple architectures, uh, but it can transfer the architecture restriction through the dependency tree. Um, it's at most 1,600 packages, which might need this workaround. Um, so. That is an idea to do. Uh, what still is missing over here is why does this affect the bootstrap? Uh, the reason is that 
the upper dependency can, be, uh, can come from a source package. And when we uh, as build depends. So and when, when we have build depends, they are treated as host architecture dependencies, and the host architecture is foreign. So in build depends, the upper de uh, dependency always is for foreign architecture. And thereby, uh, we get this uh, problem. OK, so now let's consider the satisfiability problem may be solved at some point. Uh, now we dive into cross-building packages, actually. So thanks to Depomatic, I was able to select uh, 1,000 packages by Popcorn and just build them. Took a day, was great. Um, I used uh, AMD64 as a build architecture and ARM64 as a host architecture because it was recently bootstrapped and has uh, proper support in uh, the config site files. So I, I was expecting that it would work fairly well. Um, well was not so well. Uh, less than half of the packages were ex actually successful. So this uh, runs a deeper look in the problems uh, experienced. So the most common problem over here is uh, that packages still use the build architecture tool chain. If a package just invokes GCC, then it gets the build architecture compiler. Uh, what has to be done is using a triplet prefixed version of the compiler, which encodes the host architecture. Uh, when using the CC make variable, one usually gets the wrong compiler. So solving this problem for non-auto tools packages in many cases means setting CC to something good. Uh, for auto tools, many packages just work. That's great. Um, another problem is packages which list Python in build depends or other like Perl. Um, when we just say Python over there, then what the build dependency system sees is, well, I want the host architecture version of Python. But usually when you list Python in your build depends, it's actually a tool which is used as a, uh, as a script interpreter uh, to process uh, some kind of input and um, result in further sources or like that. So what one usually wants is the host architecture, uh, no, the build architecture Python. A workaround for Python is to annotate it with colon any over here. Uh, so this says like Python is uh, multi-arch load, and we exercise that and say, okay, we want the any version here, which most likely becomes the build architecture version. Uh, another big problem is packages uh, executing host architecture binaries. So a package builds something, it uses the right tool chain, most likely, and then executes uh, it as part of the build. So we need examples for that. Uh, one example is help to man. So you run a build for a tool, and then you want to generate the manual page. So you run help to man on your program, which gets executed, and then produces the manual page. Except that executing the program you just built is not possible in a cross build. So I don't have a good solution for help to man. Uh, another class of execution problems is packages that need themselves. Like if, if there's some kind of database on the pa package, uh, which is populated initially with the tools from the package. In this case, uh, a solution can be that the package build depends on itself, which needs further thought to not break the native case, of course, right? And then, uh, there's the problem of uh, configure checks. So when running like auto tools config, um, we, we execute lots of checks. And for some old configures, which ha haven't been regenerated with auto recons in a long time, sometimes we have checks that can be made work for cross, but haven't been yet because the script hasn't been regenerated yet. Another class of problems over here is checks that cannot be implemented for crossing. For instance, if you try to observe the behavior of a library function, like well, how malloc behaves uh, if you try to allocate zero bytes, does it return null or not? And uh, these checks need to be preceded somehow to the build. And this is what is done in a file called config.site. Uh, it currently lives in dpackage cross uh, and is centrally maintained, but I'm not so sure that it is a good solution uh, long term because it 
may become a maintenance burden. So that, that might need further thought. Okay, so let's conclude our exploration of uh, compilation problems at this point and look into the bootstrap. So how does the, boot the bootstrap actually work? Uh, what we do is, of course, we first build a cross tool chain. Um, and then we need to build the cross, uh, the build essential packages. So like uh, the essential packages, then build essential and everything needed for that. Uh, then we can continue building natively in the best case. Sometimes we need to build more cross to uh, break cycles. Uh, yeah, uh, and of course, uh, during the whole bootstrap process, we need to break cycles. What this means is if two packages will depend on each other or with longer dependency chains, then one package has to be somehow built first. But it depends on the other, so it maybe cannot yet be built. And that's what we call a cycle, which needs some kind of solving. Yeah, so uh, I already said something about the package selection. So the idea is we take everything which is marked as essential, yes, and the package built essential, and then work from that and take all of their depends. So we get like libc and other libraries, and we take all of their build depends in order to build them. So, so only those build depends which are not marked multi-arch foreign, of course. Um, and then build a transitive closure of the, this. So packages we build depend on may introduce further dependencies and so on. And if we do this and look at again at the botch tools generation, uh, then we see that this results in more than 500 source packages, which is a rather lot. And uh, in the beginning, we've seen that the, mm, the tool we're using at the moment uh, is just cross-building like 100 packages regularly. Uh, and this needs rather a lot more work. Um, so let me introduce at this point build profiles, which are helpful for attacking these cycles. Uh, build profiles are a means to introduce new, new metadata into the control file and affect the build. It's uh, a way of building different flavors of a package. Uh, people who know Gentoo should think of use flags. This is basically the, th the same thing for Debian. So what a build profile can affect is uh, which binary packages are emitted. This can mean adding more packages or removing packages from the build depending on what build profiles are passed to the build. It also affects build depends. So uh, some build dependencies can become conditional to a profile being activated or not. Uh, all tools that we are aware of uh, were made to support build profiles, starting with a Debian Jesse. So if you find tools that don't support build, uh, uh, build profiles, get in touch with uh, me or Johannes Schauer so we can fix them. Um, and finally, give me, let me give an example for build profile. Uh, we've seen a little bit earlier that some packages need themselves during cross-build. And we would rather not want to inflict this extra dependency on the native build. So uh, a way of doing that is we annotate uh, such a dependency with a special profile cross which says, uh, w which needs to be activated whenever doing a cross build, but is not present in the native build, so it doesn't affect the native build. Uh, the cross profile is not meant to change which binary packages are emitted or any other thing. Okay, so uh, with this in mind, we can look at how we can get down from this more than 500 packages to maybe less or it's actually even more 600 or like that. So um, a good way to make the bootstrap easier is uh, to put things in architecture independent packages if uh, that in turn means that we can move dependencies to the build depends in depth field. Because in a bootstrap setting, we assume all architecture independent packages. We don't need to install build depends in depth and we can ignore them for that part. So that's actually a good uh, thing to do over here. Uh, another 
way of reducing build depend, uh, the size of the bootstrap, is to use a profile called node check, which uh, complements the that build option node check. So if your test suite needs a special library or tool, uh, well then we cannot run the checks uh, during cross build anyway, at least in most cases. So currently all cross compiles are built with that build options node check. So due to the node check building, we can often drop certain uh, testing tools from the build depends. And we can do that by annotating the dependency with not node check. It's a double negation, but yeah, it works. So the default is to have the check dependencies available. Uh, another profile which helps in uh, reducing dependencies, but more in uh, actually getting the cycle solved is uh, that we add stage profiles, which is to mean build a subset of the package. And this runs an example. So for instance, the OpenLDAR package and the Cyrus Sussel package integrate with each other. So Cyrus has a module to authenticate against LDAP, and the OpenLDAP server is able to use Cyrus Sussel, which is great uh, until you try to build one of them. So in this case, we can add a build profile to OpenLDAP to not build OpenLDAP, but just build the LDAP library. Uh, this example is deliberately easy uh, because it has a cycle which between just two packages, but in practice, we have much longer cycles, and these are also solved with uh, stage one profiles. Or uh, yeah. So uh, let me uh, do a little excursion for uh, what the Bootstrap tool uh, can be used also used for, uh, which is the Muzzle C library. Uh, so Debian has traditionally been able to swap almost every part of the system for another part, uh, like the kernel and uh, kind of graphics system and the init system. Uh, but what we haven't attacked thus far in detail is uh, the glibc library. So uh, being able to bootstrap may attack this one. Uh, so why does this mean a bootstrap, you may ask? It means a bootstrap because uh, the C library is part of the ABI. And the ABI is encoded into the architecture. So to do a new C library, we need to do a new architecture. So muzzle is a C library. I call it a POSIX C library because it tries to adhere to POSIX to the point of refusing fixes that makes other packages work. Uh, well, it's a decision <laughs> to do that. OK. Uh, the um, muzzle architectures will generally be called muzzle Linux and then your favorite architecture name for Linux. Um, and an example of how this can be useful, even if uh, the port doesn't become useful of its own, is that due to its POSIX adherence, it highlights bugs such as if you forget to include limits the .h uh, for something like using ulong max. So it, li like other kernel ports, we, we gain bugs and compatibility issues over here. So it's had it's this has been a fun project uh, in the bootstrap thingy. Um, I'm looking forward to how this turns out. So let me conclude the talk uh, with summarizing a few problems that are yet unsolved. So we've seen that the toolchain dependency translation issue needs a proper solution in the archive. Uh, we've also seen this uh, multi arch interpreter issue, which I'm highlighting again over here. And uh, let me also uh, say. Um, introduce another problem over here. If uh, a multi arch foreign package is currently uninstallable for the build architecture, for whatever reason, breakage in SID or whatever, then uh, apt is free to pick another architecture for your package. Um, it may end up installing the host architecture package. Um, it happily does that, and then you start building and get very weird failures. So it would be good to be able to say uh, that uh, these packages cannot be installed for foreign architectures. Um, we currently don't have that facility, but maybe we, we arrive at a solution for that. Uh, and then there is a problem with Perl, uh, which upstream never intended for cross-building. So the Perl cross-building basically means 
you have a box already for your architecture you're building for, which has SSH installed, and it does configure by e repeatedly SSHing into that box and running the checks over there, even if you have a cross compiler. So getting Perl to properly cross build uh, is a challenge. If anyone is interested in furthering <laughs> that, uh, that would be great. And uh, if we have further discussions uh, on these topics, then they are probably on topic for the um, buff on all these things, which starts tomorrow at 11 o'clock for five hours in Stockholm. So let me conclude the talk at this point uh, and ask for questions. Thank you very much. So uh, with regard to this issue about using the host architecture for multi-arc foreign, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to have build dependencies kind of have, instead of specifying colon any or something like that, to be able to specify colon build or colon host or something? Because then you could be really clear, you need this package for the build architecture or you need this that package for the host architecture. Uh, okay, so... Uh Packages already are qualified uh, in the build depends. Uh, the bu all of build depends are usually qualified as host architecture dependencies. Uh, unless you explicitly annotate them with a notation which is colon native, which means use the build architecture. But the problem with foreign, multi arch foreign packages is uh, that this can turn up in any level of the dependency tree. So it doesn't have to be a direct dependency. You can depend on something, and then it turns out later that you have to cross the multi arch foreign boundary. And then you get the wrong dependency over there. So that's not a solution, unfortunately. Um, isn't the problem there that you have a different meaning of foreign architecture here? Because by cross compiling, you also have a foreign architecture that isn't able to run things. Yes. But if you, for example, what we also have some packages that are only available on some uh, architectures. I think Wine was an example that only is available as 32-bit uh, thing. So um, if we assume a very strange package that would, uh, if we have a very good working multi-arch built depending for example on wine even for cross compiling something and you are on an AMD 64 bit then only disallowing foreign packages even for architectures that can run thing mm -hmm. might uh, even exclude more or make it impossible Yes. so it might be a, a better idea to somehow declare that specific packages uh, and specific foreign architecture cannot be run currently and rather for this you would have to some mean to express which packages have, have something you want to run. We don't have something like this but perhaps someone has a good idea in this direction. So there is a bug against the package, which is asking for different kinds of foreignness, but there's not yet agreement on whether the, this should be living in the package and how it should be implemented. Am I phrasing that correctly, Gideon? So with regards to the fact that this problem can appear anywhere deep in the indirect dependencies. Um, it's not a complete solution, but for many of those cases, the reality may be that this is actually semantically a missing build dependency from the package, that the package should actually be directly declaring a build dependency on whatever tool is being executed, because for the majority of things that you're actually going to be running from the build, um, they are things that are going to be run from the build system itself and should have a build dependency declared. It's, I understand that there, for, to fully cover the complete solution, um, we would need some semantic extensions, 
but it's quite possible that in many of these cases we should just simply add a, a build dependency that declares the architecture affinity of it. Uh, well, that also doesn't solve the problem as far as I understand it, because as soon as you annotate a binary package with the multi arch foreign tag, the architecture restriction expressed on the build dependency no longer applies. So the direct de dependency does not enforce that anymore by the mere application of the foreign tag. Okay, that seems like a bug in how we're interpreting those tags. I don't know. I don't recall what the spec says, but if, the, if, the you, if you declare colon native. The spec says clearly that when a package is foreign, then the inbound edges, dependency edges on that package, don't enforce any architecture restrictions. I think the spec is wrong then. If, if you're saying colon native in the build dependency, it should be allowed to enforce it for build dependencies. Yeah, maybe. So, yeah, it's not a problem which is practically occurring that often because the archive being that inconsistent is actually quite rare. So I'm just listing it over here because it sometimes affects it and shows up weird problems that are hard to debug. Or well, after time one figures out that one needs to look at the build dependency. Um, you had that list of uh, 1,100 packages you tried to build and yes. only 450 succeeded. Um, do you have a list of packages that would be um, the most worthy to fix because they ma would make the most other p uh, packages succeed? Like the one biggest build dependency problem? So uh, there are multiple classes of problems over there. So I've tried to categorize them already. Uh, one class of problems is the satisfiability of build depends. For that, I think... Uh, uh, where is the relevant slide? No, it, it has to be. Uh, which has uh, this URL, and it tells you very precisely which packages uh, have problems and how the problems are. Uh, the URL without all restricts uh, that to the packages which are relevant to the bootstrap. So that's one part of an answer, and then I I tried to dissect the list of build failures. Uh, so one common problem that has been submitted as a patch to DevHelper is that CMake didn't apply um, any architecture qualification. So it would just build for the build architecture. Uh, so I think the tool chain bugs are mostly being fixed right now. Uh, and the lump work is, how, uh, is doing all the little packages right. So there's in these 1,000 packages I tried to cross-build, not every package is essential to cross-building, uh, to, to the bootstrap. I just tried to f get a figure how cross-building works over there. So on uh, bootstrap.debian.net, if you go to the main page, you will find more links, uh, including some that do not yet exactly answer your question, but there is a link that uh, for every source package in Debian, um, tells you if that package were um, compilable, how many packages transitively it would make compilable as well. Uh -huh. And it doesn't exactly answer your question because that uh, answers the question for all of Debian and not only for the cross-build phase yet. But it would be easy to limit the package set so that um, uh, the numbers tell you how many package packages um, from the cross-build phase could be um, bootstrapped if that other package became cross-buildable now. Um, you had w w the example with the test suite being disabled yes. for uh, reusing build dependencies. What about uh, disabling building the documentation included in many source packages and being built at source time? Uh, we do prefer moving the documentation to architecture independent packages because it is a measure that works right now. And uh, removing the documentation from existing packages, like having a library which also sh ships documentation, but being built without documentation is the measure we consider maybe acceptable, but it changes the package contents without reflecting this to the dependency system. So 
we try to avoid that thus, thus far and try to move documentation to independent packages. How do you identify packages built with profiles? Um, uh, packages which are built with profiles have a control header in the binary package which says which profiles it was built for. Does that answer your question? Um, I want. Sorry, uh, I want to. Um, the question of about the doc package disabling. Um, I I don't see how. Uh, I, I, th I think you build the doc package and then you need to build. Uh, you, s you said that um, you prefer to have them in all architecture independent packages, but you still need to build dependencies installed that architecture independent package. Uh, that's true, but... Uh, or I, you, you can do uh, dash b, the b build, and then it might work, but you still need, need them installed in many, in many cases. No, we do distinguish between architecture independent build dependencies and architecture or, or and the remaining build dependencies. So since the cross builds only do architecture dependent builds, we do not care about build depends in depth. Uh, you mentioned uh, there are some architectures which are a bit uh, troublesome, like uh, ARM hard float, for example. Um, I remember I've also been struggling with that. Uh, and after uh, trying several configurations with uh, cross tool and G, uh, I actually did successfully uh, build glibc and uh, everything to have a full Which version chain. of glibc and which version of GCC? That's the thing I don't remember right now. <laughs> I so just remember I tried several ones. So, so we recently switched the GCC and this has only been a b becoming a problem recently oh. because the old glibc we still have in the archive uh, which enforces GCC 4.8 as a compiler does not build with GCC 5, which is to be expected, right? Yeah. So we need maybe to upgrade the GLIPC at some point and then this problem goes away. Okay, good luck then. <laughs> yeah, so uh, following up on the question, I think two questions ago asking the question, asking what, is there a list of things that if they were fixed, um, they would unblock a lot of packages. I think that's actually, that gets to the heart of, of something that I think is really important. You see there's a lot of interest in this topic in terms of the number of people in this room. How many of us are actually working on this problem today and how could you give us what we need in order to be effective contributors? So like, is you had a, f a slide that was up just previously that showed links to the cross.html and cross yes. install all of HTML. Are those the things that is like the ordered list of things you would like us to work on or is there other stuff that would be useful? And, and a suggestion to you um, as you make that uh, a response, can you post something to the mailing list telling us what to work on? To, to, to Debian Devil mailing list or which one? Yeah, we can do that. So uh, the problem with uh, giving good hints is that all of these uh, problem summaries are hard to understand. So the cross all page is not relevant to the bootstrap. It says what something about the whole archive, which is also a nice uh, feature. Uh, so the cross H HTML page says something about the package we are actually interested in. Unfortunately, 90% of the problems are not to be fixed in some packages. So um, I've been trying to fire for bugs for the problems I understand, and applying the patches is already very helpful. If you're interested anyway in these things, uh, then I'll try to do another cross build for more packages at a later point and publish the logs. You can try to find your uh, package in there. And uh, well, you can look at the cross HTML, and if it doesn't look like a problem that I should be solving, then maybe you can do that. So I think we're running out of time.
Yeah, so my question is basically in the same direction. If I wanted to support this initiative, um, should I just wait for a bug report from you? Or is there something I can be proactive about? Uh, how can I find out if my package is affected by that? And um, you, you mentioned these uh, st uh, profiles, um, stage yeah. one, blah, blah. Um, how do I know which features to disable to help uh, mm -hmm. do that? I mean, uh, I'm totally unaware of where I should look for information. Where. So in general, assume that you don't need to disable things and you don't need to add stages. This is a very hard thing to do uh, because it needs a decision in which package needs to be modified. And this needs a very high level view of the package. So unless some kind of bootstrapper tells you, please add a stage, then most likely don't. And other than that, uh, I think we need to have more QA infrastructure uh, to highlight the problems uh, maybe in the package tracking system or like that. So another archive rebuild will maybe help, help with that. Uh, and other than that, do you have any ideas? Well, I feel it's uh, the best thing to wait for the bug report from you. Uh, yeah, that's probably the best thing to do. So right now we have the the cross HTML, for example, that tells you which packages are which packages are affected. But as Helmut already said, um, that tells you about any packages uh, in the list, like because it's a trans it's a problem that goes across package borders. So even if your package is part of it it might not be the one where it is to be solved, which is also why we currently do not export it to the tracker or UDD because it might not affect your package at all. And figuring out whether it does means you have to look into the problem and you might get annoyed with having the problem shown up in your for your package because it's not the one where it has to be fixed. So it's very hard to automatically tell maintainers what to do and it needs human intervention, I think. What would help, though, uh, would be if uh, more people could try to sort out the issues that we turn up in, in, in diagnostics and sort them into things that are fixable and thing, things that are not fixable. I'll gladly help anyone who is interested in doing that. I think that we are running out of time and that we should postpone the remaining questions. Yes. Okay. We can have a small amount. So just in case the idea of five hours of this fills you with horror, um, we kind of split it up a bit. So the first couple of hours are primarily about multi-arch aspects, and then from one o'clock is like cross-building aspects, just in case you don't want to try and turn up for the whole thing. But um, we're very interested in people's feedback for anybody who has been doing work on this, um, and obviously we can discuss all this wide selection of problems, mm -hmm. some of which need to be centrally fixed and some in packages and so on. It's actually there. There's a Gobby document has the details in. If you have a look. So I guess that we will conclude this session now, and I guess lunch, dinner, food, whatever is already ongoing. And uh, yeah, thank you for showing up. <laughs>